Okay, we're talking about chapter 9 in The Great Gatsby, in the penultimate chapter 8. Lots and lots happens, ending with the death of Jay Gatsby at the hands of George Wilson. George, believing Gatsby is responsible for the death of his wife, Myrtle, believing Gatsby somehow to be the man who was having an affair with his wife, thinks this was all on purpose, and he hunts Gatsby down and kills him, and then kills himself. So, let's see what happens in Chapter 9. More twists, more turns, even a new character. So let's get started. After two years, I remember the rest of that day, and that night, and the next day, only as an endless drill of police and photographers and newspaper men in and out of Gatsby's front door. A rope stretched across the main gate, and a policeman by it kept out the curious. But little boys soon discovered that they could enter through my yard, and there were always a few of them clustered, open-mouthed about the pool. Someone with a positive manner, perhaps a detective, used the expression madman as he bent over Wilson's body that afternoon, and the adventitious authority of his voice set the key for the newspaper reports next day. Most of the reports were a nightmare. Grotesque, circumstantial, eager, and untrue. When Michaelis's testimony at the inquest brought to light Wilson's suspicions of his wife, I thought the whole tale would be shortly served up in a racy pasquinade. But Catherine, who might have said anything, didn't say a word. She showed a surprising amount of character about it, too. Looked at the coroner with determined eyes under that corrected brow of hers and swore that her sister had never seen Gatsby that her sister was completely happy with her husband, and that her sister had been to no mischief whatever. She convinced herself of it, and cried into her handkerchief as if the very suggestion was more than she could endure. So Wilson was reduced to a man deranged by grief, in order that the case might remain in its simplest form, and it rested there. So George Wilson, who was basically played by everyone in this novel, his wife, Tom, you know, taken completely off guard, ends up taking the blame for everything. By the press, he's painted as a madman. Tom and Daisy move on with their life. The case is closed. And that's it. He's vilified in this situation. Now, yes, he did murder two people, himself and Gatsby. But... He was used so thoroughly, it's almost sympathetic. Nick continues, but all of this part seemed remote and unessential. I found myself on Gatsby's side and alone. From the moment I telephoned news of the catastrophe to West Egg Village, every surmise about him and every practical question was referred to me. At first, I was surprised and confused. Then, as he lay in his house and didn't move or breathe or speak, hour upon hour, it grew upon me that I was responsible because nobody else was interested. Interested, I mean, with that intense personal interest, which everyone has some vague right at the end. I called up Daisy half an hour after we found him. Called her instinctively and without hesitation, but she and Tom had gone away early that afternoon and taken baggage with them. Left no address? Nope. Say when they'd be back? No. Any idea where they are? How I can reach them? I don't know. Can't say. I wanted to get somebody for him. I wanted to go into the room where he lay and reassure him, I'll get somebody for you, Gatsby. Don't worry. Just trust me, and I'll get somebody for you. Meyer Wolfsheim's name wasn't in the phone book. The butler gave me his office address on Broadway, and I called information, but by the time I got the number, it was long after five, and no one answered the phone. Will you ring again? I rang them three times. It's very important. Sorry, I'm afraid no one's there. I went back to the drawing room and thought, for an instant, that there were chance visitors, all these official people who suddenly filled it. But as they drew back the sheet and looked at Gatsby with unmoved eyes, his protest continued in my brain. Look here, old sport, you've got to get somebody for me. You've got to try hard. I can't go through this alone. Someone started to ask me questions, but I broke away and going upstairs looked hastily through the unlocked parts of his desk. He'd never told me definitely that his parents were dead, but there was nothing. Only the picture of Dan Cody, a token of forgotten violence, staring down from the wall. 
Next morning, I sent the butler to New York with a letter to Wolfsheim, which asked for information and urged him to come out on the next train. That request seemed superfluous when I wrote it. I was sure that he'd start when he saw the newspapers, just as I was sure that there would be a wire from Daisy before noon, but neither wire nor Mr. Wolfsheim arrived. No one arrived, except more police and photographers and newspaper men. When the butler brought back Wolfsheim's answer, I began to have a feeling of defiance, of scornful solidarity between Gatsby and me against them all. Dear Mr. Carraway, this has been one of the most terrible shocks of my life. To me, I can hardly believe that it is true at all. Such a mad act as that man did should make us all think. I cannot come down now as I am tied up in some very important business, and I cannot get mixed up in this thing. If there is anything I can do a little later, let me know in a letter by Edgar. I hardly know where I am when I hear about a thing like this, and I'm completely knocked down and out. Yours truly, Maya Wolfsheim. And then haste... And then a hasty agenda beneath. Let me know about the funeral, etc. Do not know his family at all. So, Wolfsheim, arguably Gatsby's closest friend beside Nick, won't get anywhere near this. He's like, oh, that's a shame. Sorry, can't come. When the phone rang that afternoon and long distance said Chicago was calling, I thought it would be Daisy. But the connection came through as a man's voice, very thin and far away. This is Slagel speaking. Yes. The name was unfamiliar. Hell of a note, isn't it? Get my wire? There haven't been any wires. Young Park's in trouble, he said rapidly. They picked him up when he handed the bonds over the counter. They got a circular from New York giving him the numbers just five minutes before. What do you know about that? Hey, you can never tell in these sick towns. Hello, I interrupted breathlessly. Look here, this isn't Mr. Gatsby. Mr. Gatsby is dead. There was a long silence on the other end of the wire, followed by an exclamation. Then a quick squawk as the connection broke. So clearly this is one of Gatsby's business calls. Word hasn't gotten around <laughs> to everybody, evidently. Um, now, this is clearly about that insider trading job that he offered to Nick earlier, right, as repayment for getting him together with Daisy, if you recall. I think it was on the third day that a telegram signed Henry C. Gatz arrived from a town in Minnesota. It said only that the sender was leaving immediately and to postpone the funeral until he came. It was Gatsby's father. A solemn old man, very helpless and dismayed, bundled up in a long, cheap ulster against the warm September day. So evidently, Gatsby's father is still alive, and apparently Gatsby has been in touch with him, right? If he knows to, you know, see this, so. Interesting. His eyes leaked continuously with excitement, and when I took the bag and umbrella from his hands, he began to pull so incessantly at his sparse gray beard that I had difficulty in getting off his coat. He was on the point of collapse, so I took him to the music room and made him sit down while I sent for something to eat. But he wouldn't eat, and the glass of milk spilled from his trembling hand. I saw it in the Chicago newspaper, he said. It was all in the Chicago newspaper. I started right away. I didn't know how to reach you. His eyes, seeing nothing, moved ceaselessly about the room. It was a madman, he said. He must have been mad. Wouldn't you like some coffee, I urged him. I don't want anything. I'm all right now, Mr. Carraway. Well, I'm all right now. Where have they got Jimmy? I took him into the drawing room where his son lay and left him there. Some little boys had come up on the steps and were looking into the hall, and when I told them who had arrived, they went reluctantly away. After a little while, Mr. Gatz opened the door and came out, his mouth ajar, his face flushed slightly, his eyes leaking isolated and unpunctual tears. He had reached an age where death no longer has the quality of ghastly surprise, and when he looked around him now for the first time and saw the height and splendor of the hall, and the great rooms opening out from it into other rooms, his grief began to get mixed with an odd pride. I helped him into a bedroom upstairs, and while he took off his coat and vest, I told him all the arrangements had been deferred until he came. I didn't know what you would want, Mr. Gatsby. Gats is my name. Mr. Gats. I thought you might want to take the body west. He shook his head. Jimmy always liked it better down east. He rose up to his position in the east. You were a friend of my boys, mister? We were close friends. He had a big future before him, you know. He was only a young man, but he had a lot of brain power here. He touched his head impressively, and I nodded. 
If he'd have lived, he'd been a great man like James J. Hill. He'd have helped build up the country. That's true, I said uncomfortably. He fumbled at the embroidered coverlet, trying to take it from the bread, and lay down stiffly, was instantly asleep. That night, an obviously frightened person called up and demanded to know who I was before he would give his name. This is Mr. Carraway, I said. Oh, he sounded relieved. This is Cliff Springer. Hey, the border's back, everybody. I was relieved, too, for that seemed to promise another friend at Gatsby's grave. I didn't want it to be in the papers and draw a sightseeing crowd, so I'd been calling up a few people myself. They were hard to find. The funeral's tomorrow, I said, three o'clock here at the house. I'd wish you'd tell anybody who'd be interested. Oh, I will, he broke out hastily. I, of course, I'm not likely to see anybody, but if I do. His tone made me suspicious. Of course, you'll be there yourself. Well, I'll certainly try. That's what I called up. What I called up about is, wait a minute, I interrupted. How about saying you'll come? Well, the fact is, the truth of the matter is that I'm staying with some people up here in Greenwich, and they rather expect them, me to be with them tomorrow. In fact, there's a sort of picnic or something. Of course I'll do my very best to get away. I ejaculated in unrestrained, huh? And he must have heard me, for he went on nervously. What I called up about was a pair of shoes I left there. I wonder if it would be too much trouble to have the butler send them. Oh, you see, they're my tennis shoes, and I'm sort of helpless without them. My address is care of BF. I didn't hear the rest of the name because I hung up the receiver. Now, here's the thing. You'll notice that Clipspringer says, oh, my address is care of whatever. He went right from Gatsby's house, and now he's mooching off of somebody else now. Right? But... Clip Springer is really indicative of this kind of empty, shallow world that Tom and Daisy and Jordan and they all live in. Clip Springer was all too happy to literally live off of Gatsby, but now all he is interested in is getting his tennis shoes back. He could care less that Gatsby is dead, just like all the other hundreds of people who came to his parties that summer. Right? After that, I felt a certain shame for Gatsby. One gentleman to whom I telephoned implied that he got what he deserved. However, that was my fault, for he was one of those who used to sneer most bitterly at Gatsby on the courtesy of Gatsby's liquor, and I should have known better than to call him. The morning of the funeral, I went up to New York to see Meyer Wolfsheim. I couldn't seem to reach him any other way. The door that I pushed open on the advice of an elevator boy was marked the Swastika Holding Company, and the first thing, excuse me, company, and at first, there didn't seem to be anyone inside. But when I shouted hello several times in vain, an argument broke out behind a partition, and presently a lovely Jewess appeared at an interior door and scrutinized me with black, hostile eyes. Nobody's in, she said. Mr. Wilshire's gone to Chicago. The first part was obviously untrue, for somebody began to whistle the rosary tunelessly inside. Please say that Mr. Carraway wants to see him. Well, I can't get him back from Chicago, can I? At this moment, a voice unmistakably Wolfsheim called, Stella, from the other side of the door. Leave your name on the desk, she said quickly. I'll give it to him when he gets back. But I know he's here. She took a step toward me and began to slide her hands indignantly up and down her hips. You young men think you can force your way in here any time, she scolded. We're getting sick and tired of it. When I say he's in Chicago, he's in Chicago. I mentioned Gatsby. Oh, oh, she looked at me over again. Will you just... What was your name? She vanished. In a moment, Meyer Wolfsheim stood solemnly in the doorway, holding out both hands. He drew me into his office, remarking in a reverent voice that it was a sad time for us all and offered me a cigar. My memory goes back to when I first met him. This is so, it's like another old Metropole story. Now, basically, this is how... Gatsby and Wolfsheim's relationship happened. Um, in a nutshell, Wolfsheim made Gatsby who he is, right? And you'll remember that Gatsby slips at one point and he tells Nick, you know, it took me three years to earn the money to buy it. And Nick was like, I thought you inherited your money. And Gatsby was like, oh yeah, I left, I lost it in the panic or whatever. Um, so if you kind of think about the timeline of everything we see in the story from five years ago to now it makes perfect sense that everything started really with Wolfsheim. 
a young major just out of the army, and covered all over with medals he got in the war. He was so hot up he had to keep on wearing his uniform because he couldn't buy some regular clothes. First time I saw him was when he come at the wine brand his pool room on 43rd Street and asked for a job. He hadn't met anything in a couple of days. Come on, have some lunch with me, I said. He ate more than four dollars worth of food in half an hour. Did you start him in business? I inquired. Start him? I made him. Oh. I raced him up out of nothing, right up out of the gutter. I saw right away he was a fine-appearing, gentlemanly young man. And when he told me he was in Oxford, I knew I could use him good. I got him to join up in the American Legion. He used to stand high there. Right off, he did some work for a client of mine up to Albany. We were so thick like that in everything. He held up his two bulbous fingers. Always together. I wondered if this partnership had included the World Series transaction in 1919. Well, now he's dead, I said after a moment. You were his closest friend, so I know you'll want to come to his funeral this afternoon. I'd like to come. Well, come then. The hair in his nostrils quivered slightly, and he shook his head, and his eyes filled with tears. I can't do it. I can't get mixed up in it, he said. There's nothing to get mixed up in. It's all over now. When a man gets killed, I never like to get mixed up in it in any way. I keep out. When I was a young man, it was different. If a friend of mine died, no matter how, I stuck with him to the end. Well, you may think that's sentimental, but I mean it. To the bitter end. And I saw that for some reason of his own, he was determined not to come, so I stood up. Are you a college man? He inquired suddenly. For a moment, I thought he was going to suggest a connection, but he only nodded and shook my hand. Let us learn to show up a friendship for a man when he is alive and not after he is dead, he suggested. After that, my own rule is to let everything alone. When I left his office, the sky had turned dark, and I got back to West Egg in a drizzle. After changing my clothes, I went next door and found Mr. Gatz walking up and down excitedly in the hall. His pride in his son and in his son's possessions was continually increasing, and now he had something to show me. I gotta do a quick time check over here, see how long I'm doing. Oh, I got plenty of time. Okay. Jimmy sent me this picture. He took out his wallet with trembling fingers. Look there. It was a photograph of the house, cracked in the corners and dirty with many hands. He pointed out every detail to me. Look here, and then saw admiration from my eyes. He had shown it so often that I think it was more real to him now than the house itself. Jimmy sent it to me. I think it's a very pretty picture. It shows up well. Very well. Had you seen him lately? He came out to see me two years ago. Bought me the house I live in now. Of course. I'm slipping accents. Of course when we was, of course we was broke when he ran off from home. But I see now that there was a reason for it. He knew he had a big future in front of him. And ever since he made a success, he was very generous with me. So I think it's interesting. Gatsby just bought his house, basically, but he bought his father a house before buying his own, right? It looks like he didn't entirely leave Jimmy Gatz in the past. He seemed reluctant to put away the picture. He held it for another minute, lingeringly before my eyes. And then he returned the wallet and pulled from his pocket a ragged old copy of a book called Hopalong Cassidy. Look here, this is a book he had when he was a boy. It just shows you. He opened it at the back cover and turned it around for me. On the last fly leaf was printed the word schedule and the date September 12th, 1906. And underneath, rise from bed, 6 o'clock, dumbbell exercise and wall scaling, 6.15 to 6.30, study electricity, etc., 7.15 to 8.15, work, 8.30 to 4.30. Baseball and sports, 430 to 5. Practice elocution, poise, and how to attain it, 5 to 6. Study needed invention, 7 to 9. General resolves. No wasting time at chapters or a name indecipherable. No more smoking or chewing. Bathe every other day. Read one improving book or magazine per week. Save $5, cross it out, $3 per week. Be better to parents. Came across this book by accident, said the old man. Just goes to show you, don't it? It just shows you. Jimmy was bound to get ahead. He always had some resolve like this or something. So basically, Gatsby's childhood schedule here, even as a... Ooh, I'm falling back in my chair. Even as a boy, Gatsby had a dream and determination. 
And remember, we talked about his punctilious manner. He's always so careful and so planned and so specific, but this is something he always was. All right? And that's what this whole situation here is about. We will finish up the chapter in the next video.